that's what the Good Friday is about. The reason why Friday is good, because Jesus did everything for us. The greatest word for Easter is the word for. It's the preposition F-O-R, for. You have to remember that God is love, and love is not self-seeking. So Jesus never did anything for himself. He did everything for mankind, for you and for me. And what we can do in return to all this grace and this kindness and the goodness of God, it's to believe it, to act on it, to manifest it so that more and more people will catch it. Amen. And get it. Amen. So I want to talk about the word mysteries before we move on. There are many mysteries in the Bible. There's the mystery of Christ, the mystery of the gospel, the mystery of godliness. Well, before we move on to anything else, it's important for us to understand what does it mean to be godly. Because I'm fully convinced that every child of God wants to be godly. And yet, because we have never been taught, so we are a little bit confused about what it means to be godly. And actually, some Christians, they think that to be godly means that you dress poor, uh, you live poor, uh, you're never to be joyful, you're not to be excited, especially during this time of Easter. So to be godly means that you need to be sad, you, mean, you need to be sorrowful because of what Jesus had suffered, and that's repentance. So Friday doesn't mean to be sorrowful. So once again... Jesus suffered for us, so does it mean that we need to feel sad and to feel bad about it? Well, that's what we think. Once again, what we think can be very different from what the Bible says. So let's, talk, let's look at the Word of God and see what God says about godliness. So can I ask you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. 1 Timothy chapter 3, 16, we're looking at the King James. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit. Justified in the spirit, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. So here we have a package that explains what godliness is. So what is godliness? Godliness is the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Okay, that's the meaning of God was manifest in the flesh. What is godliness? Justified in the spirit. So that's the vindication. What's the vindication? The resurrection. Praise the Lord. Death could not hold him down. So what's godliness? Preached, oh sorry, what's godliness? Seen by angels. Seen by angels, or in another word, it's um, served by angels. Uh, that Jesus could send out angels. So what is that? It's the kingship. It's the authority of Jesus, okay? So the kingship and the authority of Jesus. What's the next one? Preached unto the Gentiles. What is that? That Jesus is the Messiah. He's the anointed one. He's the burden remover. He's the yoke destroyer. So praise the Lord. Amen. Preached unto the Gentiles. Believed on in the world. So what's that? Jesus being the Savior. Amen. And then lastly, received up into glory. So what's that? The ascension. So here you have a definition of what? A definition of godliness. That's what it is. So godliness is Jesus. Godliness is the life of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, the power of Jesus. Amen. So that's godliness. So to be godly means to be in Christ, that he's working in you. Amen. Incarnation, resurrection, lordship, authority, anointing, salvation, ascension, and open heaven. Praise the Lord. To have all these working in your life. So what is that? That is godliness. So from now on, please have a clear understanding of God, what godliness is. 
All right. So when you ask me, Pastor Dora, are you sure I can do this? Yes. Ephesians chapter one verse three says that we have been blessed with all the spiritual blessings in the heavens. So you can do it. You have been blessed with all the spiritual blessings in the heavens. So now let's move on to substitution. So what is substitution? Substitution is another mystery. That God has given us, the word mystery means that it's something that is hidden to be revealed by the Holy Spirit. When you have the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, then all these mysteries are revealed, open up to you. Why? So that you can manifest the life, you can manifest the power. Amen. Hallelujah. So that you can have the faith, you can flow in the Spirit. So substitution is one of the major themes in the Bible. Well, God instituted substitution even as early as in the Garden of Eden. Well, if you look at Genesis chapter three, verse twenty-one, I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. For Adam also, and for his wife, the Lord God made long tunics. Long coats of skins and clothed them. So that is substitution to be clothed. What are we? To be clothed with Christ. Who are we? We are the believers in Christ. We are the sons and the daughters in Christ. Now you have to understand that the spirit, the spirit of a man, is housed in his body. Okay. So the body is like the earth suit. When God first created the body of Adam, when first God created the body of Eve, their bodies were immortal. Now you have to understand that God is immortal, God is eternal, and everything that He has made runs forever and ever and ever until sin came in. So the body that God made for Adam was immortal, was very strong, was very powerful, and that's why he could live even after the fall, after he had sinned, lived up to nine hundred. Years and more, so we need to understand that. So we need to understand that God is perfect. Everything that He does is perfect. Everything that He makes is perfect. So to sin means you fail to be perfect. Failure means you fail to comply with God's perfection. You become imperfect. The word wicked means not straight. Okay, that means it's crooked. It's not straight. It's bent. It is not right. It is not perfect. That means it's not functioning to its optimum purpose. It's not forever. That means it only lasts for a short time. It's only temporary. Have you ever heard of symptomatic treatment? Something that lasts only for a short time? Temporary treatment? And because it's imperfect, so God has to separate them so that they won't last forever. They won't live forever. Whatever is imperfect needs to be restored or isolated, in order not to spread around. In order that imperfection would not become universal. So we need to understand that the human body has fallen from immortality. The human body has fallen from immortality. So the father, with his protective nature, with his redemptive nature, right away, what did he do? He came and he covered them with what? Animals' blood. With the blood of an animal, the skin that is still dripping in blood. Why? Why animal blood? Have you ever asked the Lord that question? Why not just? Vegetables a lot easier, you know. You have to kill all the animals, so gory and and the smell of blood, you know, in the tabernacle. We need to understand that life is in the blood, and because life is in the blood, sin is also in the blood. Sin goes down the bloodline. Sin is generational. Have you ever been to a doctor and the doctor asked you, "What about your parents? What about your grandparents? Do they have this sickness? Do they have this problem? Do they have heart problem?" All of that. Sin is in the genes of men. Nobody has to teach us how to sin. We all know what sin is. 
being prideful, self-centered, self-righteous, being angry, violent, to lie, to be bossy. So the sinful nature of man, after the fall, had become rebellious against God. This sinful nature of man is completely opposite Opposite to the nature of God, opposite to the ways of God, is rebellious against God. And that's why God has to fix it. Because God loves people and He loves to live with people. He loves to have us as His companions. So right away, God has a way and a plan to fix the sin problem. I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. Hebrews 9, 22. We need to understand that as far as people is concerned, whenever we see somebody sin, we get angry, we get upset. But we need to understand that God has an answer for every problem. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, from the Amplified Bible. In fact, under the law, almost everything is purified by the means of the blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is neither release from sin and its guilt, nor the remission of the due and merited punishment for sins. Now, we need to understand that when we talk about sin, we are talking about the bondage of sin. Sin can hold a person captive. It's just like a person who is addicted to heroin, okay, is in captivity. Or the person who is addicted to anger. Or the person who is addicted to self-pity. So sin holds a person in captivity, all right? And, uh, so, and also, sin brings about what? Guilt. With sin, there is condemnation. With sin, there is guilt. With sin, there is the remorse. And that's the, the sinfulness, that's the sin consciousness that's always attacking the soul of a man. And also when we talk about sin, we're talking about the judgment that should rightfully come to the person who sins. So when we talk about sin, we're talking about the due and merited punishment because God is righteous. So whatever is sinful needs to be judged, needs to be penalized. So when you talk about sin, you're not just talking about a misbehavior. You're talking about the whole package of the sinful nature of man, the consequences of sin, and what the sin is doing to the soul of a man. And that's why in the Old Testament, even as early as the Garden of Eden, God had to cover them with the animal blood, in order that they could continue to live. The animal blood is like a temporary relief. It's like a symptomatic treatment, a temporary relief. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the animal blood is a foreshadow of the perfect answer who is to come. What, what is the perfect answer? Who is the perfect answer? Jesus. Because the blood of Jesus is pure. The blood of Jesus is without sin. The blood of Jesus has the life of God, has the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? So Jesus is the Lamb of God. He is our perfect sin substitute. And that's the reality of that substitution. I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. When we talk about the truth, we're releasing the power that is in the word. We're not talking about mentally thinking. No, we're talking about the power being released right now as we talk about the word. So in Jesus, in him, we have redemption. What is redemption? Redemption is deliverance and salvation. Remember, it's deliverance and salvation. Through his blood, the remission was remission, forgiveness. The remission, the forgiveness of our offenses. What are offenses? Shortcomings, trespasses, sin. In accordance with the riches and the generosity of his gracious favor. 
Amen. So we need to understand that God's generosity, God's favor, God's righteousness, His grace, His mercy is much greater than sin. Much greater. We need to know that Jesus is called the ransom. The ransom means that what is needed in order that a sinner or somebody who is in jail can be set free. So Jesus is the ransom. So the ransom has been paid. So, for example, instead of going to jail for, uh, let's say, one year, you have a fine of $10,000. So that $10,000 is the ransom. So once you've paid that ransom, $10,000, you don't have to go to jail. So Jesus is the ransom. So he has legally set us free. He has bailed us out. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So the bail has been paid. The ransom has been paid. Praise the Lord. Amen. So you don't have to stay in the jail of sin and death anymore. Praise the Lord. You don't have to stay sinning anymore. You don't have to stay in death and the consequences and all the symptoms and the attacks of death anymore. The yoke to sin, the yoke to death has been broken. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. As we can see in a lot of, for example, drug addicts that have become ministers, uh, for example, those uh, that had suffered from tuberculosis before, healed and became an evangelist, you know, we've seen all this down through church history. So, well, you say to me, well, Pastor Dora, but I don't feel it. And certainly I don't act it. I don't feel that that I'm free. I don't feel that I'm living this life. Why? Well, the reason can be because you're out of touch. The reason can be that you are so distracted by the world. It's just like you've been feeding on junk food. And uh, you have not been feeding on the word and you have not been drinking of the spirit. It's like you're out of touch or out of fellowship. So your justification has been, has been bought for you, purchased for you. The ransom has been paid for you. Uh, the prison door has been opened. But you lose touch with that reality. You have become just religious. You have become just carnal or worldly, distracted. But praise the Lord, you're coming back. Amen. You're coming back to the reality of in Christ. You're coming back to the truth. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. You can be the righteousness of God in Christ. Hallelujah. So stay like that. Amen. Stay in touch. Praise the Lord with God. Stay in touch in Christ. Stay in touch with the Holy Spirit. And I found out for myself that praying in tongues is very, very powerful. It's important for us to understand that we don't live by death anymore. We live by life. And the, the Bible talks about, you know, stir up the gift that is in you. What is the gift? The gift of the Holy Spirit. So as you pray in tongues, you go, What are you doing? You're stirring up the gift that is in you. You're activating your in Christ to reality. Well, I have seen those that are very shy and they, you know, they get very shy. They don't think that they know how to pray. But as soon as they are put into the position of prayer and they start praying in tongues, then the, you know, the flow starts to take over, and the, and the prayer language starts to take over. The words become sharp, the words become precise, and the prayers of the Holy Spirit in English start to flow. So it's important for a Christian to be flowing, amen, to be active, to be always flowing. What Jesus said in John chapter 7 verse 37, he said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He said, he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, not as how you feel, but as the scripture has said, out of his heart or out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So get into the flow. Don't get stuck in fear. Don't get stuck in what's happening in the world. Get into the flow, praise the Lord, of this divine reality. Amen. 
I want to highlight one scripture to you, which is、uh, Matthew chapter eight verse seventeen. Matthew eight seventeen. What are we doing? We're eating the word this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. We're eating the divine nutrition, you know, that God has given to us. Well, Himself referring to Jesus, took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. What do we call this? We call this substitution. Amen. So let's say if I'm holding my phone in my hand, as you can see, right? So if you take this phone from me, do I still have it? No, because it's been taken from me. So what did we read just now? Himself took our infirmities. So do you still have them anymore? Do you still have potential sickness anymore? Do you still have potential problems anymore? No. Why? Because he took them from you. Praise the Lord. So don't live by religion. Live by reality. Live by the reality of the Word of God. Amen. The reality is the truth. The truth will set you free. And Bear our sicknesses. That means instead of I bearing the sicknesses, he bore the sicknesses for me when he was on the cross. Amen. How do I express my love for Jesus? Not feeling sad, not feeling bad, not crying, not crying. You know, pitying him. Honestly, Jesus doesn't need your pity. I mean, come on, be real. You think he needs your pity? No, he doesn't. He needs you to take the right place of faith, <laughs> to take the right place of reality, and act out what he has done for you. Praise the Lord! Thank you, Jesus. So, what's the focus? The focus is on Christ. The focus is on God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Because we need to understand that everything in the realm of the spirit. Has to be legal. Remember, when Adam and Eve, when they fell, the devil had the legal, the legal reason to attack the bodies of men. They had made this earth suit mortal. That means subject to decay, subject to destruction. All right. So we need to understand that ever since the fall of Adam and Eve, this body had become subject to natural and spiritual attacks, and that's why God had to cover them with the skin of an animal, with the blood dripping all over their body, and that's why the sense of survival has kicked into the human soul. Before Adam and Eve were feeling very safe, very secure, peaceful, confident. You know, Adam named all the animals, named all the vegetation, named all of creation. He had this sense of superiority. He knew that he was to take care of the animals. He knew that he was to take care of all creation. He knew that he had been given this this rulership. But what happened after the fall? Fear came in. Inferiority came in, self-doubt came in. If we were to check the human nature, it is undeniable that one of the greatest instincts is self-preservation. Self-preservation is the greatest human instinct. It is strong and it is universal. And this includes the instinct to protect yourself, to protect your family, to protect your children. This defensive instinct, this defensive instinct came at the fall. Why? It came when there is an awareness that there is a hostile presence, an awareness that there is an. Enemy who is always waiting to attack you, an enemy who is waiting to attack the body, like sickness and disease, to attack our sur surroundings, bringing calamities, disasters, attacking our relationships with wars and strifes. So this instinct of self-preservation starts to govern the human nature. 
It's very important that we understand that. But when you understand this in the context of what Jesus has done for you, that substitution, then you enter into that place of divine safety, that place of divine covering, that place of divine protection. Amen. It's very, very important that we know as Christians that we live by the life of Jesus Christ. We don't look forward to a physical death. We look forward to the rapture. We look forward to going to heaven, this eternal life. We don't live by death anymore. We don't live by fear anymore. We live by faith. We live by faith and we live by this divine life. We need to understand that fear is a learned emotion that comes with self-preservation. And the fear of death and the emotion of death, they come after the fall. Why? Because of the loss of fellowship with God and the loss of rulership through God. But when we receive Jesus as our Lord and our Savior, his death became our death. That's what the baptism is about. His resurrection became our resurrection. We've died to self and we've become resurrected in Christ Jesus. That's the, that's the essence of baptism. So today we are in Christ ruling and reigning in him and with him. Amen. Praise the Lord. We don't get into the bondage of fear and victimization anymore. Praise the Lord. We've been given the reality and the grace to rule and to reign. We are born again. The power of the rebirth. The divine birth that comes by the Holy Spirit. That comes with the substitution. That comes with the resurrection. Amen. Praise the Lord. Death is under your feet and you're ruling and reigning with Christ. When we talk about the substitution, we need to know God. In the book of Daniel, we are told that those that know that God shall be strong and will do exploits. It's important for us to know the nature of God. The nature of God is redemptive. Redemptive means he'll make a way where there is no way. Redemptive means deliverance, salvation. Amen. So don't fall into the trap of religious scrupulosity. Don't live by the law of self-condemnation, self-doubt. As soon as the Holy Spirit convicts you, change, correct yourself. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It's not that hard to correct yourself. Be quick to learn, quick to self-correct. Amen. And to live confidently by grace, by the Holy Spirit. Don't live by the letter of the law for that kills. But the Spirit gives life. Amen. Get into the anointing. Get into the flow. Praise the Lord. Don't focus on yourself. Focus on Christ. Focus on Jesus. Amen. We shall never forget, forget this scripture. Ephesians 2 verse 8 to 10. For by grace are you saved. Not by works. For by grace are you saved through faith. Not doubt. Through faith and debt not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works lest any man should boast. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus Whoa, workmanship. And that's why it is so important to keep praying in tongues. Because sometimes you don't know what to do, what you're supposed to do. And as you pray in the Spirit, you get into the flow of the Spirit. You start getting ideas from God. You start getting promptings. You start getting, you know, inventions. You start getting creative ideas. You start getting guidance. Praise the Lord. When we talk about the will of God, and that's what Jesus did. Remember in Ezekiel, God said they was looking for a man who would stand in the gap. Who is that man? That's Jesus. He is our mediator. Nobody can do that job. Jesus. Jesus. And when we are in Christ, then we can do the job of mediation and intercession. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 
And if you look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7, what did Jesus do? He said, I come to do your will. What is the will of the Father? Redemption. Redemption. What is redemption? Redemption is forgiveness. Remember in the Old Testament, there's the scapegoat. What did they have to do with the scapegoat? They had to lay their hand on the head of the scapegoat, transferring their sin into that goat, and then let go of that goat into the wilderness for as far as that goat could get. That's Jesus. Jesus is our scapegoat. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Isn't he awesome? Amen. Why did he do that? So that we can live a victorious and a free life and not be in bondage to sin anymore. Jesus does not want to keep you in sin. He wants to free you from sin. So don't you keep yourself in sin. Praise the Lord. Amen. We have been made righteous. Not that we have worked all the way to gain righteousness. You have been made righteousness by the grace of God, by the work of Jesus. Well, you ask me, Pastor Dora, isn't it true that sinners, they should be judged and they should be penalized? Well, let me ask you a question. What if that sinner is your child? What if that sinner is yourself? What if that sinner is your family? The Bible says, mercy, mercy, mercy rejoices against judgment. It's very important. Freely, freely, we have received. Freely, freely give. Practice being gracious. As we practice being gracious, we will live by grace very easily naturally and very easily. Amen? Hallelujah. When we finish, now that we're about to finish, I want to highlight the word remission. It's so important. The word remission is the word in Greek, Ephesus. It means to be released from bondage. It means to be released from imprisonment. Remission means forgiveness or pardon. It means letting go as if that person has never sinned. Remember, the scripture tells us that he has cast our sin into the sea of forgetfulness and remember them no more. That's remission. Remission of the penalty. No more penalty. So we need to understand that in Matthew chapter 26, Matthew 26, verse 28. This is what Jesus is saying. He said, for this is my blood of the New Testament. Well, they're in the middle of taking Holy Communion. He said, this is my blood of the New Testament or the New Covenant. You have to understand that the covenant is binding. All right? Between the one, the two uh, parties doing the covenant. So he said, this is my blood of the new covenant. I want you to pay attention to this. Which is shed for many. And don't stop there. For the remission of sins. For the remission. That means for the release from bondage and imprisonment to sin, for the forgiveness and the pardon of sin, for the remission of penalty. That's the nature of God. The human nature works very much from the fall, from the negative. The human nature is very protective, very territorial. Uh, when something bad happens, you know, we tend to think, oh, what else is going to happen? What else more bad is going to happen? What else worse is going to happen? We always, in the human nature, uh, are disposed to anticipate the bad. The human nature is very negative and very pessimistic in its inclination. Don't try to defend yourself. That's the human nature. We need to understand that God is not like people. He has never failed. He's never had a bad day. Praise the Lord. He is success. He is joy. He is faith. He is victory. 
And the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they have worked together to cover our weakness and our sinfulness in a wise, perfect, successful, guaranteed way. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. God is wisdom. His way is the best. Praise the Lord. Jesus is the answer to all the problems that you can ever encounter in life. So if you want not to be confused, identify yourself with Jesus. Through the Father, we identify his will. Praise the Lord. Not confused anymore. Through Jesus, our sins get forgiven. And we're cleansed sanctified. Through the Holy Spirit, we get empowered for good, to do good, to defeat evil. Amen. Praise the Lord. So dress yourself in Christ. Dress yourself in the body of Christ. I remember I woke up one morning and the Holy Spirit said to me, dress yourself in Christ. And I said, what? What dress myself? And he said, like you dress yourself with your clothes. Dress yourself from the top of your head to the soles of your feet with Christ, with Jesus. So his head becomes my head. His body becomes my body. His limbs become my limbs. And so my limbs become strong. My head becomes clear, strong. Amen. My body strengthened. Praise the Lord. Dress yourself. Amen. Hold fast to your profession of faith. Rebuke wavering. Because Jesus never wavers. Well, somebody said, the end time is coming. The end time is coming. What do we do? What do we do? Well, this is what we are told to do. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. We are told to do what? Hold fast to the profession of your faith without wavering. For he is faithful. That has promised, consider one another to provoke and to love and to good works. We are not told to just sit there and cry and moan because the end times is coming. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Now, during this time, we can't assemble. I want to tell you the fact that you can still watch live streaming, you are blessed. I really want to live stream this to our church in China, but I can't. So while you have freedom, please use it and appreciate it. The freedom that we have is not for us to sit around in fear and do nothing. I don't know, ever since I've been saved, every time when I have an opportunity to serve God, I would grab it. And if you read the Old Testament, they didn't even have Jesus. They didn't even have the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. But what did they have? The calling. The calling, the calling to serve, the calling to lead, the calling to fight. Amen. And what did they get? The anointing. Look at the anointing on Daniel, the anointing on Samson, the anointing on Mordecai, the anointing on Esther. So whenever you have an opportunity to serve, grab it. The anointing comes with the calling every time. Amen. Amen. And if you read, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exalting one another. So much more as you see the day approaching. The day approaching is when the freedom to worship, the freedom to serve will be taken from us. So while you still have that, be very active and proactive. I want to make an altar call if you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. I want to give you an opportunity to do so before we go into the communion. Jesus has given his life for you and to you. All you have to do now is to say, yes, I want it. And say this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I accept you now as my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me with your blood. Thank you for dying for my sins and resurrecting for my justification. Right now, I believe that my sins are forgiven and my spirit is born again by your word and by your spirit. Say with me, I'm saved. I'm born again. I'm a child of God. 
I'm free from the power of sin and death. I can serve the living God. Thank you, Jesus, for, for receiving me, for saving me, and for restoring me. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Now you can join us for this communion. All right? So you need to have your juice and your bread ready. We've talked about the reality of the substitution. Communion is very, very much in the covenant in our salvation. In the Old Testament, the shadow, remember in the Old Testament, they have the shadow. In the New Testament, we have the substance. In the Old Testament, the shadow of the Holy Communion is the Passover. This is so, so powerful. I mean, every one of us, we have read the ten plagues of Egypt. All right? The ten plagues of Egypt. And what's the last plague? The death of the firstborn. Okay? Because people have the tendency to idolize their children. The, the plague of the firstborn. So what happened? So when all of Egypt was going through judgment, when the world was going through judgment, what happened to the Israelites? They were at home having their Passover meal, eating the lamb. It's a lamb for a house. Eating the lamb and having the blood of the lamb covering their doorpost. That is so, so powerful. The Passover protected their entire family, protected the entire tribe of Israel. Amen. All the people of Israel. From what? From what's going on around them. Ten plagues. Ten plagues. Wow, this is awesome. And what did they have? They only had the shadow. We have the substance. We have the real blood of Jesus running in our veins. We have the body of Jesus, the body of Christ, the word that had become flesh. That's why don't live by reality. Sorry, don't live by religion. Live by reality. Is the reality of our in Christ salvation? Is the reality of the remission of sins? Is the reality of the substitution that Jesus had done for us? Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Can I ask you to um, look at Matthew? Matthew chapter 15 verse 26 said that, Jesus said that it's the children's bread. That means we are the children of God. His body belongs to us. Amen. And if you read John chapter 6, John chapter 6 uh, verse 48, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. Now, don't just quickly go through that scripture. Remember, they were in the wilderness for 40 years and there was not even one feeble in their tribe. And they only had the shadow. We have the substance. Amen. And Jesus said, I'm giving you a better covenant. I'm giving you a better, a better piece of bread, the manna from heaven. Okay. So we're going to take the communion. Remember, it's the reality of it. He said, this is the bread which comes down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. He said, I'm the living bread. He said, except you eat of the flesh of the Son of God and drink of his blood, you shall have no life in you. Remember, I talked about don't spiritualize everything. Jesus is talk about your body. Your body needs life too. Your body needs the power of life. Your body needs the energy for it to live and to live well. So your spirit and your soul and your body, all three parts live, the, all three parts need the life, the life of Jesus. Life in your spirit, life in your thoughts, your emotions and your will. So that you don't cave in to the threat 
and the fear of this COVID-19. And life, of course, in your physical body. Just like the Passover blood that says, no, you're not allowed to enter. Praise the Lord. Delivered from sin and death. And Jesus said, he that eats me shall live by me. Amen. So let's take our communion together. Can I ask you to just lift up the bread? This is the body of Jesus. It's by his stripes we are healed. So the body is for the healing of your body. So let's eat of it right now. And if any of you have any sickness, if any of you is coughing, any one of you have a running nose, whatever, or headache, whatever discomfort in your body, take this. This is the body of Jesus. Health and healing for your body. Eat of it right now. The body is for healing. The blood is for protection. It's the blood of the Lamb. It's the blood of Jesus. Life is in the blood. It's this blood that keeps you healthy, supernaturally healthy, supernaturally energized, powerful. Amen. Hallelujah. Against all the attacks of sickness, disease, accidents, calamities, disasters, against everything that the devil tries to attack you with. This is the blood of the covenant. A covenant can never be broken. A covenant that is sworn in the blood is what the Father has instituted. It's what Jesus has executed for you. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's drink of it together. Amen. 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 We've taken our heavenly prescription for immunity, for healing, and restoration to health. So God bless you. Have a wonderful uh, Easter uh, weekend. And we'll see you again on Sunday, the Resurrection Day. The power of the resurrection. God bless you.